morning, everybody, and welcome to Hope Hill's Sunday morning gathering. I am Chaplain Bob, and I want to welcome all of you here to Hope Hill's Sunday morning gathering. That was Skyly Shea with Easy to Forget for the beginning of our worship time. Let's continue on worshiping. Let's pray to God right now, and let's worship him through our talking with him, our time in prayer with him. I'd ask all of you to bow your heads. Lord God, mighty Father, we thank you and praise you for being a mighty, powerful God. You are the one and only true God, Lord. Thank you for being so majestic. Thank you for being such a, a, a father in heaven that protects us and cares for us, Lord. And in these times that are turbulent, these times that are unsure right now, Lord, we know that we have a rock to fall on, and that's you. Lord, I pray for all of our children, our grandchildren, all of the children, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that their minds are protected from the evil one, Lord. And I pray that their moms and dads and their Lolas and Lolos and their grandparents uh, and their aunts and uncles would come forward and protect these children by sharing your love, Lord, with them. Today, Lord, we're going to be in John chapter 15, verse 9 to 17, Lord. And we're going to be looking at how your love brings perfect joy in our life. Thank you, Lord, for this passage. Thank you for this time together. We love you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Again, my name is Chaplain Bob. I'm a grateful believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've joined us here today at Hope Hill's Sunday morning gathering. Let's continue on with our worship. And let's go with another selection from Skyly Shea. This is a new one from her called Wash Away. Wash Away, Wash Away from my heart this
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Hope Hill's Sunday morning gathering. I am Chaplain Bob, and so, so happy that you're here with us today as we continue in our series of preaching through John chapter 15. Now, today, we're going to be looking at John chapter 15, verse 9 to 17, and this is titled uh, Love or Friendship by Many Pastors. Um, Jesus actually calls us friends in this passage, and he instructs us to love in this passage, and then he tells us what love really is all about. So we're going to experience that together today. I want to ask you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 15, and um, remember that today is a day that you can take this information, just like it is every week here on Hope Hill Sunday Morning Gathering, take this information and apply it to your life. Make it a part of your life this week. Don't just listen to this message. Don't just share this message with other people. Apply it to your life and let other people know about what you've learned here. Uh, Not because I want to promote the Daily Dose of Hope or Hope Hill Sunday Morning Gathering, because we want together to promote Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. And I just titled this very simply, Friends. That's right. It's a very popular TV show back in the 90s, I believe it was, um, called Friends. And uh, today the fans are still clamoring for a reunion and they want these people to come back 20, 30 years later and, and be the TV show that they were before. Let me grab my coffee real quick. Thank you to my assistant, Marianne. Thank you. Um, and so they want these people to come back, these actors to come back and, and put on a show because this, this show showed how much these people loved each other and cared for each other, even in weird circumstances and humorous circumstances. But God, he shows us here in John 15 how much he loves us. And we spent some time yesterday at Hope Hills, uh, or excuse me, at Daily Dose of Hope in our video yesterday, talking about the first part of John chapter 15, where Jesus talks about abiding in him, to be in him and he in you. And when you do, when you do, when you're together with him and when he's with you, you have all the power that comes from him and you can't do anything without him. Well, today we're going to find out that you must love. That's God's, uh, it's his, his goal for your life. It's his uh, focus for your life is to love. And when we love each other, people will look at us as though we're different. And wouldn't you say today, the world just doesn't have enough love. The world doesn't have enough uh, people out there that are caring for one another. It seems like everybody wants to beat everybody down and and point out their faults and their wrongs instead of just being compassionate and patient with each other. All the things that we learn through the fruit of the Spirit. So let's uh, begin with John chapter 9 and 10 here. And uh, we'll continue on to verse 17. If you have your Bible, we encourage you to take your Bible out. And follow along with us. As the Father loved me, again, this is Jesus speaking. He's teaching. Um, He's just told a parable uh, in the first eight verses. um, And it's a metaphoric parable. um, And we believe that that parable was uh, told in the upper room. That's the a majority of people believe that's where the the focus or the uh, setting is of that story or that parable. And now he continues on um, with some instructions for his disciples, uh, just as he did in the first eight verses, but this time he's focusing on love. So Jesus says, as the Father loved me, and I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy 
may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no other than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. So I think it's pretty interesting here. Jesus actually repeats the fact that we should love one another. And like I mentioned in the intro, there are a lot of people today that are lacking love. Okay, It might be because of broken relationships. It might be because of things that they've said or done uh, to people that they once loved or once loved them. Um, Sometimes it's because of isolation. Sometimes because of fear. Sometimes it's because of the way that they were brought up as children. There's a lot of factors that go into that, but it seems like the gap between uh, people that fear and love uh, is, that gap is getting wider and wider. More people are in fear of others than they are in love with others. Uh, What I mean by this is there are a lot of people today that would rather be on their own, doing their own thing, away from everybody else, because of fear, not because they don't like people, but they use that as the excuse. I'm an introvert. I'd rather just be on my own. Or, you know, people have burned me in the past, so I'm just going to stay away from people. Uh, And then deep down inside, what God has put inside of us is that we all should be loved, and we all desire love. And we, seems like, anyways, we go to the wrong places for love most of the time, right? So let's look at each of these verses piece by piece, and let's really take the time to break these down and, um, and see what God really, how God really wants us to love each other and love Him and even love ourself. And that's a big question for you is, do you love yourself? Let's check it out. Verse 9, as the Father loved me. Now he starts off right off the bat saying, the Father loved him. As the Father loved me. He feels, Jesus Christ, the creator of everything, the Savior, he feels the love of his Father. He knows that his Father loves him. And he says, I also have loved you. So the same way that my Father loves me, I have loved you. You're getting the same love from Jesus Christ as God loved Jesus. Imagine that. And you think, I don't have any love in my life. I don't know how to love. I have not felt love. Um, I know that years ago I was a uh, missionary working and being the father of um, the daddy to many um, orphans. We had at, the, at one time, we had over 35 orphans uh, that we were caring for. And uh, they called uh, the American missionaries daddy and the mommies, the American uh, missionary uh, females mommy. And they called our caregivers mommy. And uh, the intent was for us to let them know that they were loved by many Um, We didn't call ourselves just friends. We called ourselves parents. We wanted them to realize how much they were loved. Now, can we ever love the same way that God loves us or that Jesus loves us? No, we can't even fathom what that is. But we can imagine and we can do our best to pursue that every single day. It's kind of like yesterday when I was sitting here with my son, Andre, and he had just finished his, his exams, and he said, Um, I thought this was very, very interesting because he doesn't usually talk this deep. But he said, you know, Dad, he said, 
I can pursue perfection. He said that to me. I can pursue perfection. But I'm not always going to get there, right, Dad? And he must have heard me say that a few times because he got it exactly right. You know, he's, he's pointing out to me, Dad, I did my very best on studying for these exams, and I took the exam, and I got the grade that I got. I tried my very best to pursue that perfection, but I got what I got. And I think that's what we need to do when it comes to love. Pursue the love perfection of Jesus and God the Father. You're not ever going to get there because you're not them. You're not God. But does it hurt to try to get to that level? No, it does not. Look what Jesus says. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. He's inviting us. Jesus is inviting us to be in love with him. He says, live in my love. Bask in my love. I'm inviting you to do this. Stop going to all the places that you go to to get fake love. Come to the truth. Come to the place where there's really love. He says in verse 10, if you keep my commandments, now he's talking again to the disciples. This was originally a discussion between Jesus and the disciples, but after the disciples pass on this message to us through their writings and and through the preachings and through the church, we become disciples. So this is indirectly written to us. He says, if you keep my commandments, what commandments? Well, he's going to talk about one here in a bit, but he's talking about love your Lord, love love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength. And then he's going to give another commandment here. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and I abide in his love. Now, Jesus was about to keep um, a promise from God that the Savior would shed his blood for everybody's sins. Jesus went to the cross to make sure that that prophecy, that prediction was fulfilled. Jesus is abiding in the Father's love. He's keeping the Father's commandments, and he abides in the Father's love in that way, and he's inviting us to do the same thing. Notice here, he does not say for us to be perfect in abiding in this love. Many times people get stuck here, right? They think, oh, if I'm not perfect, um, then God's not going to love me. Or God is going to do things that are going to cause me uh, to have uh, bad fortune. No, God doesn't do bad things to people. God only does good to people. Let's look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus says to his disciples, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So, what happens when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? We are showing our faith that we trust him in who he says he is, and who God said he was. Okay, And when we abide in him, when we keep his word, Uh, When we follow him wholeheartedly, what happens? He says, you're going to experience joy in your life. That's right. If you want joy in your life, you need to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have love and you're going to have joy. And if you're tired of being tired all the time, you're tired of feeling down and feeling like a prisoner all the time, abide in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will have joy and you will feel that love to the fullest. Verse 12. Perhaps the most important of these passages is verse 12. This is my commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay, 
Here it is again. This is a commandment. First one was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And here is the second one. Love one another as I have loved you. Do you know how Jesus loves you exactly? Do you know exactly how he loves us? No, you don't. But you can pursue that perfection like Andre reminded me of. You're not necessarily going to get to that perfection. You never will because you're not a perfect person. But if you pursue that perfection, you will be going for the very best, the absolute best. So why not go that way, go that direction? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And I think the more faith that you have, the more prayer time that you have with God, the more time that you have with God in his word, the more time that you serve God, you will feel more and more of that love that will bring you joy. And Jesus says here, I want you to take that love that you experience from me and from my Father, and I want you to love one another just as we have loved you. So we have a couple commandments. First one, I think, was in John chapter 10, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And now he's saying, I want you to love one another. Okay? Imagine when Jesus was on that cross, when he died on that cross, and he covered all of your sins with his blood. Imagine, he didn't do it just for you. He did it for everybody all at one time. Meaning that he was actually shedding his blood. He was actually loving the people that loved him. And he was also loving his enemies at that point in time. There are still enemies right now of God on earth. These are people that aren't walking around with sticks and, and stones and guns and evil. These are people that just have not recognized that Jesus loves them. They have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ yet. And anybody that has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ is considered an enemy of God. See, we become friends of God when we love God by placing our faith and our hope in Him. That's what it really means to be born again, is to trust God, to have a rebirth through the Spirit in God. That's really what it means. I'm trusting God more than I trust the world, more than I trust myself. I'm trusting God, and I believe who He said He is. I believe that He died for my sins, covered my sins, once and for all, for all time, and made me righteous. He made me holy enough that I could stand in front of God someday in eternity. That's the truth of the gospel right there. Let's look at verse 13. Greater love. Now, he's going to tell you greater love. Jesus actually defines what is greater love. Greater love has no one than this. So you want to know what the greatest love is of all time? It's this. Than to lay down one's life for his friends. If you want to show how great you are at loving is to die for your friends. And isn't that exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and did for me? And he did it for his enemies. He did it for those people that still haven't recognized him as the Savior. Maybe someday they will. Maybe because of you and what you hear today at Hope Hill Sunday Morning Gathering, you'll share this message with somebody, and maybe some of those people that you share it with will go from being enemies to becoming friends of God. Look what it says in the next sentence in verse 14. You are my friends, Jesus says, if you do whatever I command you. So far, Jesus has said, go out and love your Lord, your God, with all your, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Go out and do that. And then he says, love each other. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. 
You want to be a friend of God? Maybe today is the day for you to be a friend of God. Maybe today is the day that you step over that line and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. You believe that Jesus rose again, fulfilling all the scriptures. And you believe that Jesus is still alive. And you believe that Jesus gave you everlasting life. Free gift. He gave it for you. He gave his life for you. And that's what he says there in verse 13. He says, you want to know what the greatest love is of all time? Laying down your life for another person, for your friends. Not just a stranger, but for your friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And he said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Did you know that you were called a friend of God? If you, if you abide in him, if you do what he asks you to do, you're considered a friend of this, in, this creator of this entire universe. The most powerful being ever. The one and only true God. You're a friend of his. Now, no other religion in the world can say that. No other faith in the world can say that. Not the Muslims. The Muslims don't look at Muhammad as a father. There is no word in the Quran for father. There's no friendship there between the people that, that uh, worship uh, Islam and their God. Same with the Hindus. Uh, same with the Buddhists. Uh, it's just not there. There's no relationship. But the one and only true God wants a relationship with you, and he wants a relationship with me. And so what he, what he does is he offers his son, Jesus Christ, to take care of all those sins so that God can have a relationship with you. Because prior to Jesus going on the cross, you and I were consider, considered enemies. So imagine Jesus actually goes on that cross for you and me, but he also goes on that cross for enemies of his. And that's how much he loves. I don't know that. I, I can't imagine loving somebody so much that I would die for them. Now I think about my own family. And I think a couple weeks ago, uh, it's appropriate to tell this story. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were out on an errand, and my wife had some things that she needed to do while we were out, and I took her for a ride in the car, and we were coming back, and uh, it was after a couple of days of rain, and um, I was driving past a few motorcycles, and um, apparently my car splashed one of the motorcycles. I didn't know it. I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't even driving that fast, but this guy got very angry and he turned around and he followed me all the way into my village. And he was angry, you could tell. But at some point in time, he just kept following, kept following, kept following. And at, at a certain point in time when I'm inside the village, he's now intruding on my family. He's now endangering my family. My wife's in the car, and my son is just around the corner at our home. So what did I have to do? I got out of my car. I put the car in, in park. I got out of the car, and I confronted this person on his motorcycle as he was behind me. And when I went around to confront him, he's yelling at my wife through the window. Well, I had to put a stop to that. Because I love my wife, I love my son, and I'm not going to let anything bad happen to either one of them. So I did not allow that to happen. I was not going to allow that to continue. Now, that's not dying for my wife or my son, but I would be willing to protect my, my son and my wife to death if I was put in that situation. And there are times in life when we are faced with these things. We see them a lot on videos, right? But imagine Jesus allowed God to put him on the cross to die for everybody's sins so that we could be made right before God. That's how much Jesus loved us. Verse 15, 
He says, no longer do I call you servants. Okay, again, Jesus is talking to his disciples here, right? And a lot of times, if we go back to the Jewish tradition of rabbis and their disciples, um, those disciples would become like servants for the rabbi. They would do things for the rabbi to make the rabbi's life easier so the rabbi could impart knowledge to them, okay? But Jesus does something radical here. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. And if you think about that, if you've ever had any employees that you've hired, um, you don't tell your employees all this, the strategy of the business, right? You might have an inner circle of managers that know the strategy of the business, but the average employee does not know the business of the owner. Does that make sense? So the person that's working at the mall that's greeting people to buy perfume, they don't know the strategy of SM's CEO. Okay, do you understand that? So Jesus says, a servant does not know what his master is doing. The servant has no privilege to knowing what the master is about to do or the strategy that the master is going to employ. He says, but I have called you friends. That's right. He called his disciples friends. He says, you, in verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Love the Lord your God with all your might, your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, okay? And he says, and you are my friends if you do whatever I command you, okay? He says, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So these disciples, the 11 disciples at this point in time, they know everything about the father in heaven they know everything that the Father in heaven that has been passed down to Jesus. And so they have all the strategy in front of them. And so at this point in time, these are not servants. These are not typical disciples of a rabbi. These are friends. And Jesus, this was a radical statement because these 12, which would become 11, as Jesus was turned over, uh, to the leaders, these disciples, these apostles, knew everything. In fact, they didn't even understand that they were going to write what we call today the 66 books of the Holy Bible. They were going to write the New Testament. These people that were with him, his inner circle, knew everything about him. In fact, he divinely placed it in their minds. He breathed it into them. These are his friends, and we are his friends when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become a friend of God. Again, a radical idea because there is no other faith in the world where the average person calls their higher power a friend. We call Jesus our friend and most importantly, he calls us his friend. Look here in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now let's stop there. Did you know that when you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't choose God? God chose you. That's right. The creator of this universe chooses you. So if you're a believer right now, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God chose you first. See, this is one of the things that's a beautiful thing about Christianity. We realize that we did nothing for the grace that God gives us. We did nothing for the grace that God gives us. God chooses us first. I want that one right there. 
I want her. I want him. I know that people say he's been a bad guy his whole life, but I want him. I want to love him. And I died on the cross for him. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, let's go back to the Jewish tradition of rabbi and disciple. Usually in a rabbi-disciple relationship, the disciple would choose the rabbi. It happens today. If you want to be mentored by somebody in business, for example, you go out and you find the best business person, and then you say, can I take you for a cup of coffee? Would it be okay if we spent some time together? And then maybe after a couple of times of meeting with this person, you say, would you be my mentor? It's usually the disciple chooses the rabbi. But not in this case. Jesus chose those apostles. And Jesus chose you and he chose me. He says, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So when you are saved by the grace of God through the faith that you have, that that faith was given to you by God because he put it on your heart. He says, when you have believed in me, Jesus is basically talking about himself here. When you believe in me, the Savior, I am asking you to go out and bear fruit. I'm appointing you so that you should go out and bear fruit. So here's a question from the video yesterday that we did. Does God want us just to be happy with being saved? No, he does not. God doesn't want us just to look forward to death someday so we can go to heaven. God wants us to go out and bear fruit in our whole life. Now, I think he's still watching, but there was a a young man that my son, Andre, and I encountered a few weeks ago, and um, his name is Gerald. And his son, his brother, I think Jerry is the brother's name, they um, happened to be in this area where we were going to look, where Andre and I were going to look for a waterfall. And Gerald came up and said, can I take you to the waterfalls? And he accompanied me and my son all the way to the waterfalls, about a mile and a half hike from where we parked our car, so about three mile round trip. And he spent the day with us. He watched my son. He took video of us. See, on that particular day, I believe that God used Gerald to show us, me and my son, how much he loves us. And Gerald accepted that opportunity to do something good, to bear fruit. God had already put that in Gerald's path long before we ever went on that trip. Gerald had that in his DNA from the very beginning. Someday you're going to meet this American missionary and his son, and you're going to take them uh, to the waterfalls. It seems very simple, but for me and my son, that was a great thing, and we'll always be grateful for that. So Jesus says here, I have appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now he's talking again specifically to these disciples. He's saying, I want you to go out and bear fruit. I chose you before you chose me. And because of that, I want you to go out. I appoint you to go out and bear fruit, spread my word, spread the the truth, spread the love of God. And he said, and then that your fruit should remain. Now that's supernatural power. 2,021 years later, does God's word still remain? Does everything that happened in the Old Testament still remain? Yes, it does. The world cannot cancel God. The number one selling book of all time is the Bible. It's all supernatural. 
The Bible can never be taken off the shelves. They can try. They can try their best at canceling God, but it will never happen. I told you this a few days ago. God is fastest growing. The God movement, Jesus movement, is the fastest movement in China right now. In Iran, number two in the world, fastest growing. The fastest growth of Christianity in the world is in Iran. Number five in the world is Afghanistan. God is growing The gospel is moving in these countries faster than ever. Why? Because it's supernatural power. Jesus says it here, so that your fruit should remain. And he says that whatever you ask the Father in my name, in the name of Jesus Christ, he may give you. So if you're doing some kind of work for God, and you ask for certain things in that work for God, you're doing a ministry Uh, you're feeding children, or you're um, out teaching, or maybe you're out rescuing people, maybe you're out uh, evangelizing, and you need certain things in your ministry, you ask for that in from the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says he will give it to you. As long as it lines up with God's will and it's according to God's plan, he's going to give it to you. Guaranteed. Don't doubt it at all. Verse 17. Jesus sums this up by saying, These things I command you, that you love one another. He says it a second time. You need to love one another. Now, I remember when I was a kid, my mom would repeat several times, Clean your room, Bob. Clean your room. Your room is dirty. You can't come out of your room until you clean your room. When my mom would repeat things more than once, I listened because I knew that she was serious about whatever it was that she was telling me about. Now imagine God's Son, Jesus Christ, has commanded us twice now in one passage of eight verses, I think this is. He's commanded us twice that you love one another. Some people say, well, I want to do simple acts of kindness, random acts of kindness, right? Not a problem. Good idea. I want to do random acts of love. Good idea. Do it. Show each other that you love them. Uh, I think there was a study... I think it's my Bible study teacher on Wednesday mornings, Keith, a friend of mine. He's the leader of this Bible study. And he said that there was a, he quoted a study that said, the average teenager and adolescent, meaning younger child, will recognize 13 more negatives, negative statements in their life than they will a positive statement. So in other words, on a daily basis, the average child hears 13 times more negative than they do positive. So how about changing those tables? How about letting people know how much you love them? Love is very contagious, much more contagious than negativity. But the thing is, right now in the world, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of hate in the world today. There's a lot of divisiveness. There's a lot of fake news. And so what happens is people start to repeat that because that's what they hear, that's what they know. But how about try loving people? Let people know how much Jesus and God the Father loves them. Try that. And then see what happens in your own friends, your circle of friends, in your family. And with your colleagues, the people that you work with, people that you go to school with. Love them. Truly love them. And start calling them friends. And how do you, why, do you, why would you call them a friend? Jesus says you call them a friend because you tell them everything. If you have true friends in your life, tell them everything. And that one thing that you conceal, you conceal sometimes Jesus. You conceal 
You don't want your friends to know that you're really a follower of Jesus. Like a few days ago, I said, for a long time, I lived as an undercover Christian. I didn't tell people that I was a Christian for many, many years. Why was I being secret about that? We already mentioned it earlier. Jesus, his message has spread for over 2,000 years, not because of man, but because of his divine power to make that message get through. And then he says, anybody that abides in me will be able to do greater things than I do. So take the chance today to find out how much God really loves you. God is the most powerful being ever. It's time for you to take the chance today. It's time, if you haven't been born again, to just step over the line and just simply say, yeah, Lord, I love you. And I want to be called a friend. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, Mighty Father, we praise your holy name. We're humbled by your words, Lord. And we, we just say, Abba, Father, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy, for all that you wrote to us today, Lord. We know that you're our friend. We don't need to look at you as a slave owner or as a boss. We know that you are our friend. You love us. You love us so much that we can't even fathom how much you love us. Lord, maybe there's some that are listening or watching right now that want to step over the line. They want to be called a friend. And all they have to do is say in their heart, very simply, Lord, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ saved me. He saved me by going to the cross. Thank you, Lord, for that. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. That's it. And if anybody has prayed that prayer right now, Lord, I pray that, uh, as the Bible says, you're going to throw a, a party in heaven for them. And someday you're going to welcome them. Thank you, Lord for what you're doing in this ministry. Thank you for what you're doing in my life and in my family's life. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. I pray a, press, a special prayer for later this afternoon when I have a baby dedication that I'll be officiating. I pray that everything goes smoothly for this baby dedication. I pray that the sun would come out so that everybody can pass to the baby dedication without any complications of, of rain and such. And I pray, Lord, that all the plans would go to fruition. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Okay. Um, that was one great message for me. I don't know about for you guys, but for me, that's a great message because I can feel how much God loves me when he says a few things. One, he calls me a friend. That makes me feel incredible. Two, he says he laid down his life just for me, and he did it all at one time. I don't have to keep going back to the cross every time looking to Jesus. He's already forgiven all of my sins all at one time, and all I've got to do is just believe in him. So for me, I took a lot out of this message like I always do. You think it's weird that the preacher would take information out of a message, but I always do. It always happens that way because God really truly does speak through those that are at the pulpit. And so I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you'll, you'll send this to your friends. In fact, I'm going to put down here um, below, I'm going to put down my Rumble account, my, our YouTube account, and I'm going to put down, of course, our Facebook account. And we would love it if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our Rumble channel. And please pass on these videos to as many people as you can because people today in the year 2021, they need God. They're looking for God. This world has is, is got all the craziness that's going on, but God is the solution to everybody's problem. So I would encourage you to take the chance today to go ahead and pass on these videos to other people. Okay, everybody, I'm going to say goodbye. I've got to prepare for my baby dedication that I'll officiate later today. Appreciate your prayers on that. 
And uh, we will see you on Tuesday with our next edition of the Daily Dose of Hope. Now, here is some Skyly Shay. Uh, this is titled Shelter from the Storm. Enjoy this. Bye bye. When life keeps falling and wonder where he is in all this mess, he's right there to guide you. Unseen, you're not alone. His light shines on the past that we're not shown. Give me shelter, Lord, from this storm. As it poured, you made it cure. And in over. To heal saves us from our faults and fears, giving us the peace that we so desperately need. Give me shelter, Lord, from this storm as it us to call on him his peace and love are shall